Welcome back. Let's now shift our attention to sorting a list of numbers. Let's quickly create a list of numbers. So let's say a list of integer numbers is equal to new. Nope. List dot off. That's the easiest way, right? So let's say 123, 12, 3, 45. So it's a list of numbers. And because we would want to be able to sort it, what we would need to do? We would need to create an array list because this is an unmodifiable list. I'll go ahead and use the reference variable as list of integer numbers al is equal to new array list of numbers. That's cool, right? So now we have numbers al is equal to new array list of numbers and now we can modify this. Let's check if there is a method called sort inside the integer array list. Oops, there is. And now let's try and call this sort. Aha. It says I would need a comparator. So what is a comparator? Let's get to that a little later. So if I want to by default use the sort method which is present inside the list interface, then I would need to use a comparator. Let's not really worry about what comparator is for now. We'll get to comparator a little later. For now, there is another sort method which is present. So we tried to do the sort directly using the array list method or the list method actually. Now let's see another method. The other method is collections.sort and you can pass in which array list you would want to sort. This is a static method. Sort is a static method which is present in collections and numbers al is the collection you would want to sort. So let's do that and let's now print numbers al. Okay, cool. Now it's sorted 3, 12, 45 and 123, right? So this is basically the popular way to do sorting collections dot sort. Now let's go ahead and actually create a more complex class. So instead of storing just numbers inside a list, what we'll do is we'll try and store objects of a specific class. Let's go to the Eclipse workspace. This is almost the first time that we are creating a project for collections. So let's get started with creating a project for the collection. So new Java project, I'll say collections and you can click enter to finish the thing right now. Once you click finish and you create the project, you'd be able to go and create a new class, right? So typical stuff that we have doing multiple times, class, and this one, I would want to call it a students runner, or we can call it students collection runner. And I would add a main method, right? What I would want to do is I would want to create a student class. So let's create a new class, class, student and um, let's go ahead and add a string name let's make it private as usual private int id and i'll create a constructor you know how to create a constructor right so it's basically right click source generate constructors and choose this we have a constructor let's create get us and setters right click source generate getters and setters and I would want to create getters and setters for everything. So what we have created is a very basic class. So we can create a student and we are able to get and set the IDs as well. So that's cool. Now in the students collection runner, let's create a list of students. How do we create a list of students? Let's say I would want to create three students with specific IDs and names. Can you go ahead and try how to do that? Okay, let's get to how to do that. The way you can do that is list of student. Students is equal to, let's use the list dot off method itself. And over here, I can create new students, right? So new student of one comma ranga. Let's create a couple more. So I'll put a comma here, new student of Let's say the ID of this student is 100, comma, Adam, and another student, new student of two, 
comma if. Let's make sure that the imports are there. So I would want to make sure it's java.util. Be careful, it's not java.awt. Sometimes people make a mistake of choosing the wrong package. We are interested in the java.util.list. So let's go ahead and do that. Now, if I go ahead and actually do a sysout of students right now, what would be printed? Think about it, what would be printed? What I would want to do is make that better. So let's go to the student class and have a two string, public string, oops, two string and return ID plus space plus name. Just a couple of concatenation so it should not be a problem. Let's now run this. Now you'd see one is wrong at 100 is Adam, two is Eve. That's cool, right? So now we are able to print the students and see the values which are present in there. And now what we want to do is sort the list of students. Since we want to sort the list of students, what we can do is we'll create an array list for the students, right? So list of student, we want to modify the list. So we would all go for an array list. Students AL is equal to new array list of students. Now I would need to import the array list, java.util.array list. So let's import that as well. Now one of the th important things is we are using array list in all the examples because that's kind of the default. Whenever we talk about collections, the first thing which comes to our mind is array list, right? So that's the reason why we are using array list. But in these examples, you could have used linked list or vector without a problem with exactly the same results. So the results will not change. The performance might change a little bit, but the results would exactly be the same. Now, I would want to start sort the students which are present in students AL. How do I do that? Do you remember what we used earlier? We said collections dot sort, and we passed in students AL. This is a compilation error. If I look at, I press control and hover over this and go to open implementation, you'd see that only comparable interface implementations can be passed in. I can only pass array lists with those classes which implement the comparable interface. How did it work with integer? Let's take a look. Control Shift T integer Java 9. You can see that it's already implementing the comparable interface. If I look at the comparable interface, control and click this, you'd see that there is a method which is present in here, compare to. This compare to defines how can you compare two objects of the same type. That's basically what we are implementing in here. So if you want to be able to sort two numbers, you need to know which one is greater. If you want to sort two students, you need to tell which one of those is greater or lesser. And we use the comparable interface to do that. We saw that integer and string classes already provide a implementation of the comparable interface. That's the reason why we were able to use them in collections.sort. But for student, we need to implement the comparable interface. Let's look at how to do that in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. The previous step was one of the first steps where we ended with a compilation error, right? That's not really good. Let's fix that in this specific step. We said we would need to implement the comparable interface in the student class. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'll open, it, open the student class and I would want to implement comparable interface, right? So we already talked about interfaces. When I implement a interface, what I would need to do? I would need to implement all the methods which are defined in there. So now, as soon as I say implements comparable, I get a compilation error. I'll take the shortcut, control one, and say add unimplemented methods. Where is the unimplemented method? That's down here, right? So compare to, you can see that this is generating an object. Actually, I would want to compare with other students. So I'll say comparable of student. Now, I can actually change this to student as well. So we would want to compare one student with another student. So that's the reason why we did that. And now, 
how do we want to compare these students i would want to when i sort i would want them to be in the increasing order of ids so i would want to use the id and sort them in the increasing order of ids so we would use something called return integer dot compare and say typically this is the way it would be this dot id and typically when we write to compare to we call this dot so this is the current object that is the object we are comparing against so the integer dot compare is an awesome implementation this is this is present from one of the recent versions of java java 7 and if you see this it returns if x is less than y it returns minus 1 if x is equal to is equal to y then it returns 0 uh, if x is greater than y then it returns 1 so that's how the comparable interface also works so what would happen here is the current id would be compared with the id of the student that we are going to compare it against now let's go ahead and save the student collections runner you can see that the code compiles and now let's do a system.out.println after the sorting let's see what would happen so you can see that now the students are sorted according to their ids now if you want to reverse the sort order then what i can do is this would ensure that the smaller one gets preference now if i want to reverse it i can say integer.compare that.id comma this.id i'm reversing the order so what would happen when i execute it okay you can see that 100 is first 2 is next and 1 is next so for reverse order i would send that first for the ascending order i would send this.id first in the short step we learned how to use a comparable interface implementation so how to provide a comparable interface implementation for a student and sort the students based on our own criteria until the next step bye bye welcome back in the previous step we looked at how to implement the comparable interface and do the sorting using collections.sort we implemented the algorithm that we would want to use to compare two students and that was used to sort the students so we saw that when we changed that first and this next then we were able to sort it in the descending order of ids however you might have a question what if i would want to sort it differently in different situations over here what we are doing is we are implementing it in the student class directly right so i'm implementing the logic on how to compare students and how to sort them inside the student class directly let's say i would want in certain situation i would want to use ascending sorting and in certain situation i would want to use descending sorting how can i implement that that's a great question let's answer that in this specific video one of the things that we can look at is the collection.sort method right? the collection.sort method we were using this one until now there is an overloaded method which accepts an implementation of something called a comparator so when you are sorting you can also send a comparator in as the second an implementation of the comparator so what we want to do in here is now implement a comparator so instead of creating a separate class i would create a small class in here so class i'll call this descending comparator or descending student comparator because this is going to compare students implements we are going to implement the interface comparator and for students so we would want to compare students right so let's do that let's import java.util.comparator there would be a compilation error that's cool control one add unimplemented methods and now i can go here and implement the comparison typically what i would love to do is go here and say this is student one this and this is student two right so student one student two and how do we compare we already know the integer.compare so integer.compare student one student two right now we have oops i want to compare their ids not the students themselves right so 
get.getID. Okay, cool. Now this would be ready. The descending order comparator is ready. So I can now just say this is ascending order plus this. If I want to sort in the descending order, then I can do this. I can pass a new instance of the student comparator, descending student comparator. And what would happen? Let's print that out. So after using descending sorter comparator, this is the result. Let's run this program and see what's happening. Cool, right? So when I'm doing using the default, I'm not passing any argument. Then it's using the logic which is in the student class and that's ascending and descending. Actually, you can implement multiple implementations of the comparator interface. So I can copy this and I can create 10 different implementations and I can sort the students using 10 different algorithms. If you want to sort by name, if you want to sort by ID, if you want to sort by combination of name and ID, whatever combination you'd want to implement, you can go ahead and implement it and sort based on it. Now that we have implemented a comparator, let's get back to something which we saw in this last step. We saw that there was a sort method which was present inside the implementation of the list itself. So in the array list, there is a sort implementation which accepts a comparator. So now actually I can use this comparator. I can use the new descending sort comparator in here as well. So if I actually do this, so this is one option collection dot sort and the other option is actually directly call the sort method and passing the descending student comparator. And when I run this, you can see that it's as expected. One of the errors that we have done is actually what we are implementing is an ascending student comparator, right? So we are putting it in the ascending. So let's rename this. So right click refactor rename. I would want to actually call this ascending. This is an ascending student comparator. And over here as well, this should have been ascending student comparator. And I'll change everywhere to be ascending student comparator. And let's run this. And now you can see ascending student comparator is 1, 200. And instead of ascending, this should have been descending. <laughs> okay. Looks like I have to get my maths right again, right? So I have forgot what is a descending order and ascending order. Descending order is going down and ascending order is going up. Mm -hmm. I'm making such silly mistakes, right? Never mind. Let's focus on what we have learned in this specific step. What we have done in this specific step is we created a comparator class. Implementing a comparator class helps us to implement different algorithms for the same student. So for this student, I can compare based on ID, name, or whatever I would want to compare based on and have multiple algorithms. And depending on the one situation, I can use this specific algorithm which I would want to use for sorting. I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this step, let's review what we have learned about list interface and a few implementations of it. List extends the collection interface. So it implements everything which is present in the collections interface. And in addition to that, it would provide methods which care about the position of the object. So you can insert elements at the end of the list, in the middle of the list, wherever you'd want to. We looked at the list interface and we saw wide variety of methods. We saw add all, get, set, add, remove, index of, if you want to find the last index of, because the list can have duplicates, the same element can be present three or four times. Last index of can be used to find the fourth, the last position of a particular element. We looked at the wide variety of methods which are present in the list interface. We also looked at iterators and how to loop around the list. We looked at three different implementations of the list interface. One is the array list, which uses array as the underneath data structure. That means insertion and deletion are slower compared to linked list. But if you want to access a specific element at a specific position, you'd be able to do that very fast. Linked list, the underlying data structure is a linked list, which is a doubly linked list. So you have linked to the element before and the element after. 
The thing about the linked list is that iterating it is slower as well as finding an element based on a specific index is also very slow compared to an array list. However, you'd be able to insert and delete elements faster. We also looked at vector, which is a thread safe implementation of a list. Vector implements thread safety by using synchronized methods. However, there's a performance impact when you're using vector in a multi-threaded scenario because all the methods in vector are synchronized. We will talk about better approaches to thread safety called concurrent collections after we discuss about threads. In the next step, let's move on to the other collection interface, set. I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this step, we would switch to this set interface. Until now, we have been talking about the list interface. Let's start talking about the set interface here on. In this step, let's understand what is unique about the set interface and what kind of situations you'd go for a set interface. The set interface extends the collection interface but does not really provide a lot of new methods. Then, what is the need for a set interface? The most important thing about a set interface is you can only have unique things. You cannot have duplicates in a set. If two objects are equal, then only one of them can be in this set. The other thing is compared to the list interface, set interface does not provide positional access. Let's do a hands-on and look at both these points in this specific step. How do we create a set? It's very similar to how we create list, right? Set of string set is equal to new, nope, list dot, nope, set dot off. So set dot off, I want a set of apple, banana, and a cat. Mm -hmm. This is cool, right? We said set does not allow duplicates, right? Let's say I'm trying to add, set dot add, apple again. Will that allow me? Nope, it says unsupported operation because set by default will not allow modification. We need to create a hash set. So hash set is one of the implementations of a set. We'll talk about the different implementations of set in the next step. For now, let's go ahead and say hash set is equal to set of string hash set is equal to new hash set of the set we have already created. We'll want to use the same data. Now, in a hash set, let's try and add in apple. Will this be allowed? What will happen? Try and guess. It says false. It says Apple is already in the list. Why do you want it add? Why do you want to add it again? So if I actually press has set, then you can see apple cat banana. There is no new apple. The other interesting you can thing you can already see is that apple banana cat has become apple cat banana. So the order is already lost. So when we are using has set, we saw that the order is a little different. Even here, when we created the set, you see that when we created a set of apple, banana, cat, but it became banana, apple, cat. The most important thing is a set does not care about the position of the element. It cares, okay, there is apple, but it does not worry where the apple is present. That's why you cannot say set dot add two comma apple. You cannot do set dot add anyway because it's unmodifiable set. You cannot even do hash set dot add. It says no suitable method found for add because on a set you'll not be able to do add based on a position or remove based on a position. In summary, in a set you'd not be able to have duplicates and in a set the position is not really important. So you cannot say I would want to add uh, element at a specific position. Those are the two important differences between a set and a list. Set is used to store unique values. 
I'll see you in the next step where we would start talking about the different implementations of the set, including the hash set. Welcome back. In the previous steps, we looked at two basic data structures. One was array. Array stores all the elements sequentially. And whenever you delete an element, you have to remove that element and push all the other elements after it to the left. But retrieving values at a specific position with an array is very easy. I can directly say I would want element at index 5 and I'd be able to directly get 80. The other data structure we looked at was linked list. In linked list, each element is linked to the next one. And in doubly linked list, 25 is linked to 4 as well as it has a link to 45. So that's called a doubly linked list. In linked list, insertion and deletion of elements is easier because if I have to remove 25, all that I need to do is move the link from 45 to 4, 25 is deleted. As simple as that. If I add, if I want to add a new number, 21 in between, I just put 21 here and change the link of 25 to 21 and 21 to 4. However, with a linked list, trying to retrieve something at a specific position or searching for something is a costlier operation because you have to traverse through the links one by one until you go to the end of the list to find out if something is present in the list. The data structure that we want to focus on in this step is called hash table. It takes a completely different approach on how it stores elements. It tries to combine the fixed positions similar to an array and the advantages of the linked list. For example, here we have 13 different positions which are present in here. These 13 things in here are called buckets. And you store elements into each of these buckets. How do we store elements into this bucket? We have something called a hashing function. So let's say I would want to decide where I want to store 15. Which bucket do I want to store 15? What I would do is I'll evaluate the hashing function 15. The hashing function we are using in here is mod 13. So we would divide by 13 and take the reminder and put the element in that bucket. For example, over here, 15 mod 13 is 2. That's why it's in the second bucket. If I want to put 34, you can see it in the bucket with index 8. That's because 34 mod 13 is 8. 34 is 2 times 13 is 26. 34 minus 26 is 8. That's why it's at index 8. You can see that 13 is at index 0 because 13 mod 13 is 0. So what we are doing is we are using something called a hashing function. The hashing function is used to decide which bucket an element goes into. Let's say now I would want to insert 2 into this list. What would happen? I would do 2 mod 13. The bucket number is 2. So I would want to store it in here. There is already 15 in here. So what we would do is we would attach 2 to this list. So in addition to 15, we will have 2 in here. Let's say I would want to delete 34. All that I need to do is 34 mod 13. I would get 8. I will come here and see if there is 34. And if 34 is there, this element is deleted. Let's say I would want to find out if an element 4 is present in this specific hash table. I would do 4 mod 13. 4 mod 13 is 4. So I would check at index 4. At index 4, nothing is present. So 4 is not present in this list. The advantage of a hash table is that you can easily insert elements in and you can search for elements and you can delete elements much more easily. Hash table provides very fast searches. Insertion of elements can be little slower than the li linked list at certain point in times, but it's much faster than an array. The efficiency of the hash table will always depend on the efficiency of your hashing function. In Java, we would implement the hashing function using something called hash 
code. If you look at the object class, there is a method called hash code. That hash code is used to determine which bucket an object gets stored into. The hashing function which we are using in here, mod 13, is just an example. There might be a variety of hashing functions which might be used in different kinds of scenarios. These hashing functions we can implement using hash code method in Java. One of the most important things is you do not need to be an expert on hashing or hash table. The idea behind this is just to give you a high level picture of how hashing works so that when we introduce collections which are based on hash tables at a later point in time, you'd be able to get how they work in the background. In summary, the key part of a hash table is the hashing function. We use the hashing function to decide which bucket to store an element into and if there are elements attached to that bucket already and you are trying to insert a new element, it would be added to the list of elements. Hash table makes searches also very easy because you directly go to the bucket and look for the elements. So you are not really searching the entire list of elements, but a set of certain elements inside that particular bucket. Similar logic applies to insertion as well as deletion of elements as well. In the previous steps, we looked at a few data structures, right? We started with arrays, we looked at linked lists, we also looked at hash table, and now we would be looking at another data structure called tree. The awesome thing about a tree is it helps us store elements in a sorted order. There are a wide varieties of trees which are present. In this specific example, we are using something called a red-black tree. The details are not really important. It's very important to understand how data is stored into a tree. How are elements stored into this specific tree? If you look at this specific tree, you can see that all the elements on the left hand side of every element are smaller than that element. And all the elements on the right hand side of an element are greater than that element. So if you look at 45, left hand side, 35. 30, 25, 40, right? On the right hand side, 50, 60, 65, 80, all of them are greater. And if over here, 35, right? 35, left hand side are 30 and 25, and right hand side is 40. Same is the case with 60. Left hand side is smaller, right hand side is greater. And 65, right hand side is 80, that is a greater number. So if there was an element that needs to be inserted, let's say it's 63, where would it be inserted? It would be inserted on the left hand side of 65, right? So this is where the element 63 would go in. A tree helps in making sure that you are storing the data in a sorted manner. If I want to find the smallest element in the tree, all that I would need to do is go to the left, 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 and I find the smallest. If I want to find the largest element, right, 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 until there is a right, and that's the largest element in the tree. So trying to find out larger elements, smaller elements, sorted elements in a tree is very easy. And also, the insertion and deletion and searching operations are not very costly. You cannot directly say whether it's 65 is present or not. We need to go through a list of operations, right? Let's say I'm searching for 65. I would start with 45. 65 is greater than 45, so I would need to search the right subtree. Now I would come here, 65 is greater, so I would need to go to the right subtree, and I get to 65. So with three operations, I'm able to search. Same as the case where I'm trying to insert or delete. So it would be three or four operations in this specific tree. So a tree helps in reducing the cost of search, delete, and also inserts while keeping the data in a sorted way. So you'd be able to leave the data in a sorted way and do efficient searches. In the last few steps, we try to give you an overview of the different kinds of data structures. We talked about arrays, linked list, hash table, and in this video, we talked about trees. In the next video, we will get back to discussing about collections. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this step, let's do hands-on on, on hash set, 
linked hash set and tree set. Let's start with creating a hash set. So set of integers, so we'll st store a list of integers. Numbers is equal to new hash set of integers. So we are initializing a new hash set. You see that numbers is empty right now. Let's add in a few numbers. So we are using a hash set. I would add 765432. It's a number, right? So, oops, I need to remove the quotes, right? So this is now a number. I'm adding in more numbers, right? So I'm del deleting one digit at a time and trying to store the value, right? So now we have a set to which I have added in five numbers. The order in which I have added it, you can see that on the screen, right? First, I've added in this, second, this, third, fourth, and fifth. Now, if I print numbers, what do you see? You see that they are stored in random order. So they are not stored in the order of insertion. Nope, that's not the order in which they are stored. They are not stored in sorted order also. In a hash set, we don't care about the insertion order and we don't care about sort order. Now, let's create the same numbers thing with a link hash set. So I'm creating a linked hash set and let's execute the same code again. So now I'm creating a linked hash set. So 765435 And now let's try and print what's there in the numbers. What do you see? You can see that linked hash set is storing the elements in the order in which they are inserted. So just the order in which I'm inserting them, it's being stored. It's not stored in or sorted order, but it's stored in the order in which it's inserted. Let's say I'm adding in one more element. What would happen now? You'd see that it's exactly stored in the order in which elements are inserted. However, because this is a set, you cannot store duplicates. So if I say 76, what would happen? It would return false back. It says, okay, boss, you are using a set. You cannot store a duplicate. Let's go and create a tree set as well. So let's now create numbers as a tree set. Now numbers is empty. So let's add all the values as earlier. So 765432, four and five seven six right now if i print numbers what would you see you are seeing it in this sorted order right so in this specific thing we are storing the numbers in the sorted order because it's a set this also will not add duplicate values what we did in this video is we looked at all the three different options for sets we understood that a hash set neither cares for the sorted order or the insertion order. A linked hash set stores the insertion order, but it does not worry about the sorted order. And the tree set cares about the sorted order, but it does not care about the insertion order. Now, let's look at the exercise for this specific step. What we want to do is we would want to create a list of characters like shown in the screen. So create a list of characters like this. Probably you can write a class, a Java class in Eclipse where in the main method, you can have a list of characters like this. What I would want to find out is the unique characters in this specific list. Think about what would you use if I would want the unique characters in a sorted order. And what would you use if I would want the unique characters in the order in which they are present? So in unique characters in sorted order would be A, B, F, and Z. But unique characters in the order in which they are being inserted is A, Z, because A is repeated, I don't include it, B, and then F. So it would be A, Z, B, and F. Think about what collection you would be using to be able to do that. I'll see you on the other side. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this video, let's solve the exercise from the previous step. Let's create a new class 
and I'll call this set runner and I'll add a main method as usual finish and I will paste down the characters from the previous one right so I'll do the imports Java util list that's cool and now I would want to find out what are the unique characters in a sorted order right so the as soon as somebody says unique to you the thing which should come to your mind is set so the solution for this is a set right so as far as set is concerned as of now we have options three tree set we have hash set and we have linked hash set right so if i want to store elements in a sorted order then we would go for a tree set right so i would create a set of character and say tree set is equal to new tree set of characters is that allowed let's check let's import tree set let's import set now you can see that this code is going through so it's allowed so let's now print see this out and tree set see what would we output now it's printing a b f z in sorted order right that's because we are using a tree set so let's make sure that it's clear it's a tree set okay tree set right i would want to store in the insertion order a first z next is duplicate so don't worry i don't worry about it b next and then f then what i would need to use what do you think i should use i should use a linked hash set because that's the one which maintains insertion order over here it should not be tree set it should be linked hash set right so now i can go ahead and print let's import linked hash set and let's use this in both places right so now let's see what would be the output you can see that the elements are stored in the order in which they are inserted a z b f a z b and f that's cool right now if you don't care about this i mean if you don't care about sorted order or if you don't care about insertion order then you can go with a hash set let's quickly do that so hash set we would want to use a hash set and i'll copy this here and over here as well and let's import hash set right so now in the hash set you are getting the same output as the tree set but it might not be the same let's say if i just add in a few more elements it might be different if you make it numbers then it might not be the same hash set would depend on the hashing function sometimes it might be sorted but you cannot depend on it being sorted the most important thing out of this particular exercise and the previous step is that if you want unique things so if i want unique things i have to go for a set and once i go for a set the decision you need to make is whether you want to maintain insertion order or whether you'd want to maintain sorted order if you want one of them then you would either go for a tree set or a linked hash set if you don't care about neither then you would go for a hash set out of all these hash set is the most efficient but linked hash set provides you with insertion order and tree set provides you with sorted order in the last few steps we looked at the different set implementations from wide range of perspectives in the next step we would look at tree set in more depth until then bye bye welcome back in this video let's look at tree set in depth the operations that can be performed on a hash set and a linked hash set are exactly same as that on a collection however a tree set provides you more operations because the data in it is sorted what tree set provides is a implementation of something called a navigable set and because of tree set implementing a navigable set we would get a few 
features from that. Let's explore that features in this specific video. Let's now create a tree set, right? So typical way of creating a tree set is tree set of integer and numbers is equal to new tree set. Now, I would also want to initialize a few things in here. So let's directly do that in here. So I'll say set dot off and provide a few numbers, right? So it does not matter what they are, 34, 12, 99. Cool, right? So we've created a tree set and you can see that it's in sorted order. That's the basic characteristic of a tree, right? In a tree, everything is sorted. So that's what you see in here as well. Tree set also implements a navigable set interface. That means it provides a few other operations which are traditionally not present in the collections interface. These kind of operations are only present on trees, on places where there is data which is sorted. So let's try them right now. So numbers dot, let's say I would want to find out what is the element which is lower than 40 in this particular list. So I want to find out what is the element which is lower than 40 in this list. Which is the element? 34. The floor is inclusive. So if I do floor of 34, it would return 34 as well. However, if you want strictly lower than 34, you don't want to match 34 and you would want only those numbers that are less than 34, then you can say lower. So floor, floor returns the number which is less than equal to 34. Lower returns a number which is less than 34, which is 12. So you don't really need to implement and find out which is the element which is less than 34. For any of the numbers, you can find out what is the one which is less than that very, very easily. Floor or lower. The same thing applies for ceiling of 34. It returns the number which is upper than 34. So ceiling is greater than equal to 34. So if I say 36, greater than or equal to 36, it returns 54. The other corresponding function is upper. So upper would not return, so upper is greater than 34. Oops, it's not upper, it's higher. So higher returns the number which is greater than 34. So let's print numbers again so that we have it right here. So greater than 34 is 54. You can also try and retrieve a subset of this. You can try and retrieve Okay, I would want all the numbers which are between 20 and 80. How do I do that? Numbers dot subset of 20 comma 80. So what does it retrieve? 34, 44 and 65. These are the numbers which are between 20 and 80. Let's try another option operation. Th subset, I would say 34 and 54. So you can see that it's only returning 34 back. So the lower limit is inclusive, the upper limit is exclusive. So it's not included. So it's, if I do this, so all those numbers are returned. So greater than or equal to 34 and less than 65. If you would want to explicitly specify, so I would want to include greater than or equal to and less than or equal to, you can say this. So then it, it, it would act as if we would want to include both the lower limit and the upper limit. So this is inclusive here and inclusive on this side as well. And if I do a false, both of them would be excluded. So only 54 is printed. The other interesting method which is present is numbers.headset and you can say 50. So it prints all numbers up to 50 and you can do tail set it prints all numbers after 50. In this step, we were looking at some of the most interesting methods which are present in TreeSet because TreeSet implements the navigable set interface. Because the data in a TreeSet is sorted, we can try and get values between a certain range or less than a specific thing or greater than a specific thing. And that's exactly what we were doing in this specific step. I hope you had a great time learning about the set interface. I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. This video is part of a Java course with more than 250 steps 
helping you become an expert on Java. You can find the complete course details in the description of the video. Along with it, you can also find the details of a free PDF with 200 pages of awesome code examples in 28 minutes, creating great programmers.